It's a pleasure to introduce the last speaker of today, Mario Bonk, Expanding Certain Maps. Yes, so uh, first of all, I should uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, conference here. It's a great uh, pleasure and also a great honor to be a speaker here at uh, this Dennis Fest. Yeah, the title of my talk is Expanding Thirst Maps. And you should think of my talk in some sense as a compliment uh, to the lectures that uh, Bruce Kleiner gave. Uh, in the sense of the Sullivan Dictionary that we will hear more about uh, in uh, Dick Canary's lectures. So, uh, uh, roughly speaking, the Sullivan Dictionary uh, creates some analogies between the world of Kleinian groups and, well, the world, let's say, of complex dynamics. What we've seen in Bruce's talk, uh, talks where, well, a lot of geometric group theory and these kind of things, and my talk is in some sense a complement, so I'm moving to the world of uh, branched covering maps in a certain setting. Uh, so let me start with some basic definitions. So I'm essentially just working oops, on the, on the two-sphere. And for the moment, uh, you should think just of the two-sphere as being a topological object, right? So we don't have a metric yet, or at least no canonical metric. Well, sometimes it's convenient, actually, to just fix some base metric. But the only role of this base metric is to induce the topology of our given uh, two-sphere. And so uh, then we are looking at uh, maps from this two-sphere to itself. And we want to look at uh, what I call branched covering maps. So what uh, is the definition? Well, the map should be continuous and orientation preserving. And the main condition is the second condition, that near each point I should have a local model. So near each point I can introduce suitable coordinates in a source and target of the map so that the point, oops, so that the point uh, corresponds to uh, the point P here corresponds to zero in the source of the coordinates and uh, to, uh, the, the image point should correspond to zero in the target so that the map locally looks like Z goes to Z to the D. Yeah, and I mean, the definition, of course, is modeled on what's happening for uh, rational maps on the Riemann sphere. Yeah, so it's, uh, you all know that uh, if you have a rational map on the Riemann sphere, well, then you have exactly this local model. So rational maps on the Riemann sphere would be prime examples uh, for what I call branch covering maps. Okay, so uh, let me make uh, two more definitions here. So typically this number D here is equal to one. So the points where actually D is greater equal to, they are isolated points. Uh, so I call this number D the local degree of my map at P. And the points where this degree is greater equal uh, at two, yeah, so these are finitely many uh, points on the sphere, uh, they play a special role. So they are exactly the points uh, where my map is not locally injective, and I call these points the critical points of F. Okay? So my notation for this set is uh, a C of F, so the critical points of my uh, map F. So one more definition here. So once I have this critical set, then I can define an important set that uh, will, will be very relevant for my talk here, the so-called post-critical set. So I have a branched covering. So I look at uh, the set of critical points, and I look at the forward uh, orbits of these points. So often people uh, put, uh, put a bar here, so they take the closure of this union. This doesn't really matter in my situation, because I will be mostly interested in the situation where the so-called post-critical set is actually a finite set. Yeah, F to the n, of course, will mean the uh, nth iterate of F, so we're interested in dynamics. So we compose the map uh, n times with itself. And well, if you know a little bit about complex dynamics and you know that a lot of information about the dynamics of a, a rational map under iteration is somehow encoded in the dynamics on critical points. Yeah, so for example, uh, there's this classification of two components and uh, there are these different types, essentially five different types. And much information about these two components of a given map can actually be read off uh, from the dynamics on the critical set. And uh, this is the reason why this post-critical set is uh, so important from the dynamical point of view. I don't want to really go into this. Uh, here's just a very simple-minded reason why this uh, post-critical set might be relevant. Namely, uh, you can think of the post-critical set just as the union of all critical values of all iterates. Yeah? And uh, if you think of the post-critical set in this way, well, uh, then you observe that each iterate is actually a covering map in the complement of uh, the post-critical set. 
Yeah, so this will be uh, kind of important for us. So in other words, uh, to phrase it different, differently, the points in the post-critical set essentially are uh, uh, obstructions to taking uh, inverse images of iterates. So what is a Thurston map now? Well, a Thurston map is essentially a branched covering map where this uh, post-critical set uh, is finite. Yeah. And I should mention that there are different viewpoints how you can uh, look at uh, these uh, first maps. Uh, one viewpoint is this, and I think this was uh, the original uh, point of view of uh, Thurston, namely, you can look at these Thurston maps not necessarily as pointwise de defined maps, but rather as a class of maps up to uh, isotopy relative to the post-critical set. And then you can study things like the dynamics on isotopic classes of curves. Yeah, so as I said, I mean, I think this was mostly uh, Thurston's point of view. But you can have also uh, a, a different point of view where you really look at the pointwise dynamics of the map in the spirit of uh, complex and rational dynamics where you're really interested in, well, pointwise orbits of uh, points under iteration. Of course, these uh, points of views are closely related. Often, you have a given a class just up to isotopy, and uh, one of the questions that you might be interested in is uh, find a good pointwise representative of such a, representative of such a class. Yeah, so these are things uh, that one uh, should keep in mind if one uh, looks at these first maps. So for my talk, you should rather mostly think of the second point of view. I'm really interested in the pointwise uh, dynamics of my uh, first maps. So let me go through some uh, explicit example of a thirst map. And in some sense, uh, this uh, slide here is the most important slide of my talk, so I will spend some time explaining uh, what is going on here. So let's first uh, look at this picture here on the right-hand side. So this is what I like to call a pillow. Yeah, so what is a pillow? Well, I try to create some uh, uh, 3D effect here by drawing this curve here. It's just uh, two copies of uh, the unit square glued together along their boundaries. And what you then get is just a sphere drawn in a funny way. Okay? So here on the left-hand side, uh, you have a picture that is very similar in spirit. So essentially what I did here is I took my pillow and I made a slit here. And to this slit, I glued what I like to call a flap. Yeah, and you should really think of this flap as something where well, you can kind of stick your hand from underneath. So again, you have two sides to your flap, so I try to indicate this by drawing this curve here. Right? So points on different sides of the, flip are really, uh, of the flap should really be uh, viewed as different. Yeah, and well, I mean, here the sides of the slit, of course, also represent different points. Yeah, so if you glue this kind of flap here on the uh, top of the pillow, well, then you still have a two-sphere. Right? So topologically, there's nothing wrong for example, with points like this, right? I mean, if, if you look at this, I mean, these points really have uh, neighborhoods that uh, are topological disks. So uh, this is also a two-sphere. Okay, so we essentially have a two-sphere. Well, you should think of this uh, just the same two-sphere, just drawn in different ways. And what I want to define now is a map, which will be an example of a first map. So what is the map here? Well, this is very easy to describe in this picture. Just look at this tiling of my uh, sphere in this picture here by these smaller squares. And what I then do is I take, for example, this uh, black square here. I just scale it by a factor 2, and I map it, let's say, to the top square of my pillow. Okay, so this de partially defines my map on this small black square. And then I extend my map, essentially, uh, to this whole picture by, well, if you know Schwartz reflection from complex analysis, yeah, I, I just do some obvious reflection procedure. For example, you know, to define the map here, what I do is this. I take a point here, I reflect over, I map, and then reflect over uh, in the other picture. So what this means is that this uh, white small square here will be mapped to the bottom of my pillow. Yeah? So I keep uh, continue doing this reflection, and you see, I mean, I get some kind of checkerboard pattern here, some alternating uh, uh, pattern. So the black squares will be mapped to the top. The white squares will be mapped to the bottom. Here, for example, uh, the front side of my flap will be mapped to the top. The back side will be mapped to the bottom of my uh, uh, will be uh, mapped to the bottom of my uh, pillow. And the reason why this is all well defined is essentially that the degree at these vertices here, where I go around in cycles, is even. You know, so if I go around once, I mean, then uh, the map is well defined because I essentially end up where I started out with. Okay. 
So this defines a map, just a map on uh, my two sphere. So now let's think about uh, the, the critical points of, of this map. So one observation is clear. If I have an interior point of one of my smaller squares, which I will actually call tiles of order one, so if I have an interior point on, in one of my one tiles, well, then the map is certainly locally injective, right? I mean, the map is just a scaling operation. So there's no problem uh, with local injectivity. So these are certainly not critical points. So every point in the interior of one of these uh, one tiles is, uh, well, there the map is locally injective. If you think about this for a second, I mean, then you see that there's also nothing wrong with interior points of uh, these edges. Yeah? So if I have such an interior point uh, on such an edge, I mean, what I essentially just do is I expand uh, these two tiles that meet at this edge, and then I just uh, yeah, I expand it by effect to two, I fold it over, right? So there's also nothing wrong uh, with local injectivity here. So the only places where local injectivity might possibly fail are these vertices of my, well, essentially it's a cell decomposition of my sphere. Yeah? So let's look at these vertices. So what's going at these vertices? Well, essentially, uh, if you look, for example, at this vertex, then you see there are uh, two, uh, well, actually in this case, three squares of the same color t uh, coming together. And then each copy of one of these squares, well, the top face of my pillow will actually have uh, one pre-image, right? For example, if you look at this point here, in the upper right corner, it will have a pre-image here, also a pre-image here. And then on the back of my flap, there will be another pre-image. So what this means is near this point, actually, I have a three-to-one map. Yeah. So, uh, or put it more intuitively, I can just read off wh what the critical points are by just looking at these vertices, and whenever more than uh, two or more uh, tiles of the same color come together, well, then I have a point where I'm not uh, locally injective. Right? So I have a point here where I'm th uh, locally three to one. Well, here, so what's going on here? Well, here I have uh, one uh, 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 black one tile on top, but then there will be another on the bottom, right? So this means actually here I'm also uh, not locally injective, I'm uh, two to one. Same way here, here, and well here actually I will be a uh, three to one. Yeah, I didn't glue a flap on the, on the bottom, so the flap only sticks out from the top. Okay, so this means I have a critical point here, a critical point here, yeah, in these uh, interiors of the large edges. So I get five critical points that I see right away. There's a sixth critical point on the bottom, yeah, because on the bottom I will just have this checkerboard pattern without the flap, so I will have a, uh, uh, I will have a map that is locally two to one. So this gives me six critical points. There's nothing wrong here with these corners. Near these corners I'm locally injective, because there I just have one black and one white square, so, you know, so I'm locally at least I, I map uh, injectively to my, to my pillow here. Yeah, so this explains this count here. So my map has uh, six critical points. It's really not hard to see that I can find uh, these local coordinate changes that locally make my map look like z to the d. Z goes to z to the d with the right exponent, the exponent just giving, given by the local degree of the map. Okay? So from this picture and you know, this explanation that I gave, you see immediately that we have a branched covering map of uh, our sphere, right? It's continuous. I mean, no orientation is reversed, and uh, we have these uh, local models for the map uh, near critical points. So now let's count uh, the post-critical set. So let's count the, the number of elements in the post-critical set. What do we have to do? Well, we have to, yes? How are you identifying domain and range? That's a question. I mean, yeah, that's a good question. Um, let me just say that uh, the identification is more or less arbitrary, but essentially I want to have an a identity map on the, well, on this boundary of my, of my pillow here. So that what I'm essentially doing, I'm defining the map up to isotopy. So I'm, I, I, can, I can push down the whole thing to make this picture look like the pillow if I want. Yeah, so this really only defines the map in this Thurston sense up to isotopy. If I want a pointwise defined map, I have to do something else, which I will explain in a second. But let me first count uh, the, the post-critical points here. So what do I have to do to get the post-critical points? Well, I have to forward iterate my critical points. 
And uh, we now know what the critical points are. There are these vertices here, right? I mean, the, these six vertices. So, for example, let's look at this point. So, what happens if. Well, I'm, I'm just doing it. So, so, right? I mean, this corner here is mapped here, right? And to see where this corner goes off to further iteration, we'll have to look at this point. And I mark by a dot actually all the points that are mapped here. So this means already after the second iteration, I end up here, and this is a fixed point, so nothing happens after that. Right? So this means after two iterations, I actually I end up here, and I go through the corners of my uh, big pillow. Right? So this actually means that my uh, post-critical set consists of four points. The critical points do not necessarily belong to the post-critical set because I have to iterate at least once. Yeah, so I have to apply the map at least once. This, for example, means here this will not be a post-critical point because, well, I mean, it does not stay fixed or anything under iteration, right? I have to map at least once, which takes me there. So this means the post-critical set is uh, just a set of these four corners here. So I have, uh, uh, I have a set consisting of four points, so I have a, I have a Thurston map. Okay. So uh, coming back to uh, Dennis's question, uh, yeah, so as you see, I mean, there's some problems here if I want to pointwise define map because uh, these are different pictures. Yeah, so essentially, I would like to say the same sphere on, on both pictures. There are several ways, uh, well, to address this issue. One way is to just say, okay, I mean, we just take some arbitrary homeomorphism that essentially uh, makes this picture look like this picture, and we could just, for example, just flatten out this flat. You know, that's one way of doing. Or well, the other way of doing would be, well, just fix an arbitrary homeomorphism that make, maps this thing to this thing and preserves at least this uh, isotopic class here. Then you would get a well-defined class in the Thurston sense. But the third and right point of view is this. Namely, you take this picture as a basis of a construction of a self-similar fractal where you essentially iterate this step going from here to here on all levels. So what I mean is this. So, so we know, uh, we do have some chalk here. Yeah, so we know that uh, this black square is mapped to the top pillow here. But let's think of the top, top pillow looking like this. So what this means is I sh should then actually draw this, uh, this black square that I see. So I have my flap here. But I should really draw my black square exactly in the same way as this picture on the left. So I should really draw it like this. You know, uh, also some subdivision with a little flap sticking out. For the white uh, squares, I don't do anything because, uh, well, I don't create this flap on the bottom. Yeah, so this means, I mean, this stays the same. And then again, I have a black square. Now I have to be a bit careful here with the Schwarz reflection. So I think I, I should have to, to draw the picture like this. Then I keep repeating this procedure, right? I mean, there's a natural coloring of the tiles. And again, all the tiles, I mean, they should be drawn in a certain way, so there should be some flap sticking out, right? And if you keep doing this procedure, then you get a self-similar fractal, and then you get a well-defined pointwise map, because then the map would just take, uh, for example, this thing, scale it up to the same picture just by a factor two. Yeah? So this is really where the map lives, and this is for the point of my for the point of view of my talk, actually, uh, the right way to think about this. So in some sense, these, uh, the dynamics uh, create some kind of fractal space, and I'm interested in, in the fractal space and the dynamics of the map on this fractal space. A different point of view yet is uh, a, a, a purely uh, combinatorial point of view. Namely, instead of uh, drawing these kind of 3D pictures, you can uh, think of the relevant information just given by, well, what can be called a subdivision rule, namely uh, to go from the right to the left to the picture on the, on the left. I mean, all you have to do is you have to somehow specify the combinatorics of the cell decomposition by the tiles that you see. Yeah, so, uh, so one way to draw is it like this. I mean, you have these, uh, what I call the one tiles, right? Then you have this uh, slit where you glued the flap, and now let me squash down the flap, so then I should uh, draw something like this. Yeah, so this uh, subdivides my uh, zero top tile, the uh, zero level square here on the, on the top of my pillow, 
subdivides it into six uh, topological squares or topological two cells uh, in the picture on, on the left, right? And the whole uh, information is essentially contained in uh, the combinatorics of this picture, contained in this uh, subdivision rule. So, uh, well, if you, if you look at this map, I mean, one obvious question is, has this anything to do with rational maps, right? So this is actually a basic question. So if you have uh, such a Thurston map, well, in a moment, I mean, we will define a subclass of these Thurston maps, the so-called expanding Thurston maps. Then you might ask yourself whether, uh, well, the map has anything to do with the rational map. And there are various ways to uh, address this question. So I'm formulating in a slightly stronger sense than uh, Thurston asked this question. So I want really a uh, uh, topological conjugacy of my map to a rational map. Yeah, so this is a, a question to ask if you see such examples. And let me just give the answer in our examples. In our example, the map actually does not have to anything to do with, uh, with a rational map. It does not come from a rational map. And the reason is, I mean, for those of you that know about this, uh, th there's what is called the Thurston obstruction. Okay. So uh, let me go back to uh, these uh, combinatorial things a little bit. And actually, let me, let me go to the picture again. So yeah, th I want to introduce some terminology here. So as I said, I have these tile decompositions, and I want to introduce some names here. So the, the two cells in this tile decomposition, well, I call tiles. And the tiles are distinguished by different levels, right? I saw the... Uh, a top and bottom here of my uh, pillow, I mean, uh, I call zero tiles or tiles of level zero. And then I see corresponding uh, tiles of level one here. And the question is, how do I get these tiles? Well, the procedure is very simple. I uh, just, in this case, have the common boundary of my zero tiles and I pull it back. Yeah? And then I get these complementary components and the closures of the comp complementary components. These will be my one tiles. And of course, nothing actually prevents me uh, doing this uh, also for higher levels. So here's the general definition. So I fix some level n. I look at a, a given thirst map. I specify some uh, Jordan curve uh, that contains uh, the post-critical set. The reason why the Jordan curve should contain the post-critical set is because, well, I know that if I stay away from the post-critical set, so if I'm in the, in the complement of my Jordan curve, well, then I get these inverse branches. So I can uh, pull back my Jordan curve, and I know that the complementary components of uh, these sets here actually will be open uh, two cells. Yeah, and the closures of these open two cells, this is what I want to call uh, n tiles, yeah, tile of level n. Yeah, so uh, yeah, as I said, I mean, if you look at the complementary components here, then you get uh, two cells. So the closures actually will be topological uh, two cells. Yeah, and if I look at any level here, uh, well, then my n tiles will give me some kind of a cell decomposition of my two sphere. But there's an important remark here, namely, typically uh, things will not be as nice as in our basic picture here. Namely, here we just had this kind of subdivision rule that I drew here on the board. And the reason uh, why I had such a nice subdivision rule is that essentially the cell decompositions are compatible. Right? So essentially, this is a kind of refinement of the picture that I see here. But in general, there's no reason to expect this. So if I just take a random Jordan curve, then in general, I, will, I won't have this uh, compatibility of my cell decompositions for different levels. This is only true if my curve is invariant, that uh, if, the, if the Jordan curve is contained in its own preimage, yeah, then uh, I will get uh, this compatibility of my cell decompositions which essentially allows me to describe my map by such, uh, well, by such a subdivision rule here. Let me uh, look at another example of a first map. So this uh, previous example was more in a geometric spirit. So let me lo also look at an example in a more analytic spirit. So we have an explicit formula here. So we have a, a map of degree 3 here. Omega is some uh, third root of, uh, uh, of, of unity. And well, let's look at the critical uh, points here. Well, essentially, we have a map which is given by uh, the map z maps to z cubed, followed by a Möbius transformation. So this means the, the places where my map is not locally injective are exactly the places where my uh, map uh, z cubed is non-injective, because well, the Möbius transformation putting on top of that doesn't change anything uh, on the local uh, injectivity behavior. So this actually means uh, my critical points are exactly the points where this uh, 
z cubed f has critical points, so the point zero and infinity. And to get the uh, post-critical set, I just have to look at forward iterates, right? So I have zero, zero maps to infinity, infinity maps to one, one maps to, well, to omega, and to omega is a third order of unity, so it is a fixed point, right? And as I said, I mean, we have to uh, iterate at least once. So this means my post-critical set in this case uh, consists of uh, three points. So if I want to look at these tiles, what do I have to do? I mean, I have to choose a Jordan curve uh, that passes through all these uh, uh, points here. Well, in this case, I mean, for example, I could just take the line passing uh, through one in uh, omega, well, and then it will also pass to infinity. And what I get in this case is a picture like this. Yeah? So these are the tiles of level four. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, the title of my talk was expanding thirst map. So now we know what an, a thirst map is. So let me define what an expanding thirst map is. Uh, the definition is, is very simple, namely, if I look at these pictures here, well, then a priori, it's not at all clear whether with higher and higher level, the tiles will become smaller. But if they do, then this is what I want to call an expanding thirst map. Yeah, so as I said, I mean, I fix some background metric on my sphere. It doesn't really matter which background metric as long as it induces the topology. I look at uh, tiles on level M with respect to some uh, Jordan curve passing through the post-critical set. I look at the max and the requirement is that this max should go to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay. A uh, couple of remarks here. First of all, it doesn't really matter which Jordan curve you take. So if, it's, if this condition is true for one Jordan curve, which is behind the definition of my tiles, well, then I also get it for all other Jordan curves as long as they pass through the uh, post-critical set. <laughs> and it's also, and this is very easy to see, uh, independent of the underlying base metric here. So you could, if you wanted to, also formulate this in a completely uh, topological manner. Then you have to work with open coverings and things like this. It's just a little easier to write it down in metric terms. Okay. Uh, yeah, for rational thirst maps, so for uh, rational maps that have a finite uh, post-critical set, it's actually very easy to characterize these expanding maps. Namely, uh, if you have a rational thirst map, then ex uh, expanding if and only if it has no periodic critical points. You look at a po critical point and you see whether it ever comes back to itself, well, this will be a periodic critical point. So if uh, such points aren't there, well, then the map is expanding. One can also show that this is equivalent with the Julia set being the whole uh, Riemann sphere. Criterion for the Thurston maps involving uh, the homotopy data? For yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can actually translate everything to some uh, maps, actually partially defined maps on fundamental groups, and then, you know, you can rec make some uh, expansion requirement. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's quickly come back here to our example. So how about this example? Well, the critical points are z zero and infinity. And as you see here from the, from the dynamics on these critical points, none of them is a periodic point. So this actually means this would be an example even of an expanding thirst map. Okay. Uh, yeah, in general, if you have a thirst map, then it could very well be that the map has a periodic critical point and is expanding, right? So this is somehow special for uh, the case of rational thirst maps. Well, another remark is, uh, in some sense, I mean, this assumption that you have this expanding condition is just for convenience because, I mean, if you push the theory a step further, then you certainly want to allow uh, also rational maps whose Julia set is not the whole sphere then you would have to uh, have a requirement that essentially says that the th uh, first map should be expanding on its Julia set and stuff like that. But for the question I'm interested in, uh, I mean, this, this is somehow a convenient assumption, so uh, I, I want to make, uh, make this assumption here. So uh, let's now come to an important uh, statement, namely, as I try to convince you, uh, th there are different points of views for these thirst maps, right? I mean, you have this geometric point of view where you draw these pictures and maybe you have these subdivision rules and you have this analytic point of view where, you have, for example, just write down some formula and check the conditions explicitly. The question is, how the, are these two points of view related? The question is, essentially every expanding thirst map 
is related to one of these geometric pictures? Well, at least if you take iterates. So if you take a high enough iterate, then uh, you can actually describe the Thurston map by this picture. And the reason for this is this theorem, due to uh, Daniel Meyer and myself, if you have an expanding Thurston map and you take a sufficiently high iterate, then there actually exists an invariant uh, Jordan curve uh, yeah, that contains the post-critical set. This Jordan curve actually is, is better than just a random Jordan curve. Yeah, I shouldn't have said quasi-circle here because we don't yet have the metric for which this applies, but in the, in the rational case, for example, it, it will be what is called a quasi-circle. So if you don't know what a quasi-circle is, I mean, it's a Jordan curve with better uh, geometric properties. Yeah, and as I said, I mean, the immediate consequence of this statement is that, uh, well, if you have this invariance, at least under some iterate, then essentially you can describe the Thurston map by one of these uh, geometric pictures. Yeah? Actually, the theorem that we proved is stronger than that. Namely, uh, you can even specify any Jordan curve containing the post-critical set, and then uh, you will get an invariant Jordan curve in the same isotopic class relative to the post-critical set that is invariant for sufficiently high iterates. Yeah? So essentially, every isotopic class of Jordan curves relative to the post-critical set contains curves that are invariant under sufficiently high iterates of the, of the map. There are also uh, corresponding uh, uniqueness statements. I don't want to go into this because it's a bit technical, so I don't want to state uh, these uh, things uh, explicitly. Let me try to convey some idea of how you prove the existence of uh, such an invariant curve. And <laughs> essentially, uh, well, one approach to proving the theorem is contained in, in this picture here. And it actually relates, yeah, sorry, I have to flip back here. It relates to this example. So I want to show you in, uh, in, in this explicit example, I, I want to give you the idea how you actually construct uh, the invariant curve or what one possible approach is to construct the invariant curve. And keep in mind, I mean, this is what you have to remember, that in our case here for this map, the post-critical set consists of these three points, one omega, the root of unity, and infinity. And then uh, what you do is this. So you start just with some initial Jordan curve passing through uh, the post-critical set. Yeah, so in this case, let's just take the line. And what you would like to have is a situation where if you pull back the curve by the map, well, then you're actually contained, and the curve is contained in its own pre-image. Yeah, so this is what we want. So let's take this curve and let's hope that if we pull it back, well, then we are contained, uh, then the curve is contained in its own pre-image. Well, unfortunately, in this case, this is not true. So if you pull back the curve once, yeah, what you then get is this tile decomposition of tiles of level one, which looks like this. Yeah, so here are the, what I call the one tiles. So you, as you see uh, in, the, in the one skeleton of my cell decomposition, uh, I, I don't have this curve. But I at least have a curve that is isotopic to my original curve uh, relative to the post-critical set, right? I mean, you see here, I can deform this curve that I've drawn in thick to this curve while leaving the post-critical set fi fixed, right? I can, uh, I can straighten this out here, leaving omega 1 and actually infinity fixed. Yeah? So then I take this curve as kind of my next approximation, pull it back, well, then I get these kind of higher... Uh, order level tiles. I mean, I've here drawn uh, this, this, tile, this tile composition for tiles of uh, order four. And uh, if you're lucky, then you can uh, isotope the curves into uh, this one skeleton of these higher order uh, cell decompositions. That's not always possible, but if this is possible, for example, as in this case, I mean, then you get a sequence of pictures like this. And you can actually show that under suitable conditions, this whole process actually converges. Yeah, and uh, well, this curve that you then get actually is the limiting curve, it will be invariant. Yeah, so this is, I mean, the, the limiting picture that you see here, which I've drawn in, yeah, I don't know which uh, cell decomposition this is. I mean, this is an even higher cell decomposition right here. Yeah, so there are a couple of things to address here. So first of all, this very first initial step might even fail, so it might well be that I cannot isotope uh, my initial curve into uh, 
into its uh, pre-image relative to the uh, post-critical set. And this is where uh, it comes in that I have to take a sufficiently high iterate. If I take a sufficiently high iterate, then by pulling back once, I get a very, very fine grid. And then I actually can always do this first initial step. Yeah. Then there's a slightly more technical uh, condition, namely, if you take the sequence of curves, then it's actually not very hard to show that I get some kind of exponential decrease in their mutual Hausdorff distance. So I have some kind of Cauchy sequence going on uh, with respect to Hausdorff distance. So I will always have some kind of a limit. But unfortunately, in general, the limit will not be a Jordan curve. And this is another kind of issue that I have to address. But well, it can all be overcome. So uh, what I want to do next is I want to uh, show you how you can uh, use the statement about the existence of invariant curves actually to come back to these uh, cell decompositions. And the nice thing is this. Uh, you don't really have to know the limiting curve to come back to the uh, subdivision. Uh, all you need is actually these initial pictures, as long as this curve and this curve are isotopic with respect to uh, the post-critical set. Yeah, so for the moment, let's just pretend that these curves that I see here are really the same. Let's just see if, if we have the situation, what would happen? How would the zero tiles be decomposed into uh, well, these, these one tiles? Right, you see here, one of, the, one of the zero tiles would be decomposed into four uh, one tiles, and the other would be decomposed into two uh, one tiles. And well, the combinatorics of this picture is essentially just given by this picture. Right, so yeah, let me go back here. So you see, I mean, I have uh, six one tiles coming together at zero, but there will also be six one tiles coming together at infinity. Let me draw this curve in a different way. Let me draw it uh, in this triangular way. Yeah, so this would be just one of these uh, zero tiles. And there, this zero tile is decomposed into, into four one tiles. The other zero tile that you see here is decomposed into uh, two one tiles. And why don't I see a sphere here? Well, because I made a cut along here. So this means you should identify uh, these two sides. Right? If you do this, then you really see. Uh, then you really see a sphere, and you see a, s a very similar uh, rule as, as this rule here, right? And well, I also marked uh, where the points are mapped. So this is the point zero. It is mapped to infinity by my, by my map, and so on. So this is essentially the underlying subdivision rule of my rational map. Let me yet draw it in another uh, way. Namely, let me, I mean, you see this, this looks a bit similar as this flap here. So let me kind of pull it out. Yeah? And well, here in this case, my tiles actually were quadrilaterals. They had four corners. Here, I really have triangles. I have uh, only three corners, right? So if I pull this out, I mean, then I should get something like a, like a triangular flap, as you see here. Yeah. So what this means is, I mean, in, in this example, our rational map uh, can be really described geometrically by a very similar picture as my first example. Well, the only difference essentially is instead of having these quadrilateral flaps, I have triangular flaps. Yeah. So what you see from this is uh, that the statement about invariance of uh, existence of uh, invariant curves really gives an approach to uh, looking at these uh, thirst maps or expanding thirst maps essentially from a purely combinatorial point of view. Uh, well, but there's more to be said. Namely, uh, if you have such an expanding thirst map, I said. There's no natural uh, underlying metric to begin with. But actually, if you uh, study the subject a little further, then you see that very similar to what uh, Bruce Kleiner discussed. So if you have a Gromov hyperbolic space and this the boundary, and you have a kind of net natural class of metrics, this is very similar in this context. So you have an expanding Thurston map. And then there is a very natural class of maps so that if you look at uh, tiles of order n, then uh, the size decays exponentially, like lambda to the minus n, where lambda is some factor bigger than 1, which doesn't really matter. It's very similar to the A that Bruce Kleiner had in the definition of this visual matrix. Yeah, so the only requirement for this to work is that actually this lambda should be sufficiently close to 1. Yeah? So this gives a natural class of metrics. Well, unfortunately, the lambda, this factor, is not canonical. So if you take different lambdas, actually, then you get what I call snowflake equivalent metrics. So 
uh, if you raise one of these metrics uh, to a power, well, then you get the other uh, metric up to some fixed factor, which somehow accounts for the change of, uh, of this lambda here. So you can say that somehow, uh, even though you don't get a canonically defined metric, you get a canonically defined class of metrics, so you get what I call a, a snowflake gauge. I think this terminology is due to De Dennis Sullivan, I mean, this word gauge in, in, this, in this context of uh, classes of metrics. So I have a natural snowflake gauge of visual metrics, which is actually the same thing as in a Gromov hyperbolic space. If I look at a Gromov hyperbolic space, I look at this boundary at infinity, then I get a canonical snowflake gauge of visual metrics. And the nice thing about this is here, at first, I mean, this seems to depend on some choices, right? Our tiles, there's some underlying Jordan curves, that uh, underlying Jordan curve that I need to define them. But it actually turns out that the snowflake gauge only depends on the map and not on the cho initial choice of the Jordan curve. There's another condition here that I kind of, I, I lied a little bit here. So this is the relevant condition. There's some other extra condition that characterizes this gauge, but let me not go into this. So uh, one interesting thing is that uh, uh, this question that Thurston was originally interested in, namely, uh, if I have a Thurston map, you know, when is it in some suitable sense equivalent to, uh, to a rational map, can be completely addressed in these kind of metric terms. Yeah, and the theorem is this. So suppose you have an expanding Thurston map. So then we know that there's this uh, canonical snowflake gauge. So let's just pick a metric. And what we then get is we have a sphere equipped with this uh, metric. And you should tr think of it really as some kind of fractal that uh, I, well, whose construction I tried to indicate in the beginning of my talk. Right? So take one of these fractals. And then the statement is that my map is conjugate to a rational map if and only if, well, essentially my sphere equipped with one of these uh, metrics in the canonical snowflake gauge is quasi-symmetrically equivalent to the standard sphere. So Bruce Kleiner didn't define what a quasi-symmetric map is. I mean, uh, it's, it's more or less a quasi-Möbius map or quasi-conformal map. Yeah, th there's one extra condition here, this uh, non-existence of periodic critical points. So let me quickly run through the uh, definition of a quasi-symmetric map. So uh, essentially, a quasi-symmetric map is a map that satisfies uh, a certain distortion condition for relative distances here. Well, I put up a slightly simplified uh, definition that applies in this context here. Essentially what the condition says is that uh, metric balls are mapped to roundish objects with controlled eccentricity. Yeah, so this is really the, the geometric uh, content of uh, this, this inequality here. Yeah, so this is what I wrote here. And as I said, I mean, uh, for quasi-conformality, we essentially just require that uh, infinitesimal balls go to, well, infinitesimal objects with controlled eccentricity. Here we made a, a kind of global requirement, so quasi-symmetry is stronger than quasi-conformality, so we get this implication, quasi-symmetric implies quasi-conformal. If you want to relate uh, this to some other class of maps that you uh, know, in the class of Lip by Lipschitz map that distort distances just up to a a uh, bounded multiplicative amount, well, then uh, this clearly implies uh, the quasi-symmetry. Yeah, so you have this chain of implication. And well, in good context, yeah, for example, for these Loewner spaces that came up uh, in Bruce Kleiner's talk, this notion of uh, quasi-symmetry and quasi-conformality are equivalent, well, if Q is bigger than one. Okay, so that was an important uh, requirement. So, uh, well, let me come to, uh, to the Sullivan Dictionary. So I mentioned in the beginning you know, that the things that I will be talking about are related to certain questions in geometric group theory. Well, there's this correspondence between these different worlds. And the correspondence of my theorem here that I mentioned, I mean, the geometric group theory correspondence actually is a conjecture in a slightly different spirit. It's called uh, Cannon's Conjecture. And Cannon con Cannon's conjecture predicts that if you have a Gromov hyperbolic group whose boundary at infinity is a topological two-sphere, well, then somehow the group should arise from some standard situation in hyperbolic geometry. So essentially, the group should be uh, the fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic uh, uh, three-orbifold. Yeah? So I mean, the precise statement is this. So if you have a Gromov hyperbolic group uh, whose boundary at infinity is a topological two-sphere, 
then uh, the group should admit an action on hyperbolic three space that well satisfies these conditions that came up in uh, Bruce Kleiner's talk, so should be discrete, co-compact, and isometric. So what has this to do with quasi-symmetric maps and these kind of uniformization problems? Well, the point is this. Uh, this, what I call version one of Cannon's conjecture, is equivalent with another version where, uh, well, you look at your Gromov hyperbolic group, you look at this boundary at infinity, but now we know it's not just a topological object. Yeah, it has this canonical snowflake gauge of metrics. So let me just pick one of these metrics. So I have a metric space then. And you should think of this as some kind of self-similar fractal, right? I mean, in, in Bruce's talk, I mean, he mentioned that, uh, yeah, what did he call this? This, uh, uh, this kind of self-similarity property. Yeah, so you should think of this as some kind of metric or uh, self-similar fractal. And uh, this version one of uh, the Cannon conjecture would be true if you can show that this metric fractal actually is quasi-symmetrically equivalent to the standard two-sphere, so that you could find a quasi-symmetric homeomorphism to the standard two-sphere. Yeah, now remember this theorem that I had about expanding Thurston maps. So your rational map, if and only, uh, your conjugate to a rational map, essentially if and only if, uh, your sphere equipped with one of these visual metrics is quasi-symmetrically equivalent to the two sphere. So this is exactly uh, in, in the same spirit as uh, this theorem. So of course, I mean, uh, this conjecture and my uh, theorem that I mentioned, uh, well, raises some obvious questions here. Namely, if I have a metric two sphere, how can I possibly show that I'm quasi-symmetrically equivalent uh, to the standard two sphere? So essentially, I would like to have some metric, uh, metric uniformization type theorem. Yeah, so I mean, the classical uniformization theorem says that if I have a Riemann surface, which is, uh, which is a topological two-sphere, well, then there's always a conformal map to the Riemann sphere. So here, I essentially want a metric uh, space version of this, where the class of conformal map maps is replaced, essentially, by quasi-conformal maps. And this uh, conformal structure is essentially replaced by some kind of metric type structure. So I don't know how much time I have left. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. Yes, yeah, so what I want to do now is I want to mention some uh, statements in this direction which are not really uh, that new. So uh, yeah, let me, let me put this in some kind of more general uh, context here. So the, the underlying question actually can be called the quasi-symmetric uniformization uh, problem. So if I have a metric space and some kind of model metric space, yeah, and well, I assume that there's no topological problem, so I assume that they are homeomorphic. And then the question is, when can I promote this homeomorphism actually to a better homeomorphism, namely to a quasi-symmetric homeomorphism? So this is really what I want to know, whether uh, these two spaces are quasi-symmetrically equivalent. Of course, I mean, this is a very general question. It depends very much on the context uh, how you interpret this question, right? I mean, for one thing, I mean, you have to interpret uh, what it means uh, to be a standard metric space. But I mean, there are some obvious cases that are interesting, interested in, right? I mean, Rn with the standard Euclidean metric Sn, let's say, with the spherical metric or the standard uh, one-third Cantor set and, uh, and things like this. And I mean, the, the case uh, that is particularly interested, interesting in view of Cannon's conjecture and this uh, theorem about expanding Thurston map that I mentioned is this case where the standard uh, space is just the two sphere. Yeah. So, uh, of course, you can also ask this for higher dimensions, but there the question is completely inaccessible. You can also ask it for lower dimensions. So for example, you can ask when uh, a metric circle is quasi-symmetrically equivalent to the standard circle, but this question is completely understood. I mean, it was essentially uh, answered by R force in the early 1960s and has to do with this notion of a quasi-circle that came up uh, on one of my slides. Yeah. So this case, I mean, it's particularly interesting, not only because, well, if you somehow get, get good information on this, I mean, then it relates to all kinds of other things. I mean, these expanding Thurston maps or a gram of hyperbolic groups. But it's also interesting because it's just some kind of borderline case, right? I mean, the lower dimension cases are kind of easy. The higher dimensional cases are hopeless. But here you have a case where you still uh, can say something. So uh, Bruce Kleiner mentioned already one kind of uh, uniformization theorem in uh, this uh, spirit, right? He, he said that if you have a, 
If you have a two sphere, which is a Loebner space, then actually uh, it's quasi symmetrically equivalent with a two sphere. Uh, let me just state one other theorem that goes in this direction. And in order to uh, state the theorem, I need two definitions. Fortunately, they already came up in Bruce Kleiner's talk. So the first definition is, well, he called it linear connect. What did he call it? Well, he, I think he left out the local. So I call it linear co local contractibility. So let me go through this here. So if you have a metric space, then you call it linearly locally contractible. Essentially, if you, well, if you take any ball, then there's no guarantee that you can contract it to a point. Yeah, for one reason, I mean, it might not even be a, a connected set. But the requirement is that if you enlarge the ball by a fixed factor, yeah, then this inclusion map actually will be homotopic to a constant map. So what this intuitively means is I have this ball, I allow a little leafway given by this uh, multiplicative uh, factor here, and then I can shrink everything to a point. Yeah. So uh, on, an, on a more intuitive level, I mean, this is a condition that somehow uh, rules out cuspy things. So we are interested in two spheres. So for example, if you have a situation where you have these uh, long, f uh, thin uh, fingers sticking out, so this would be a situation where this is violated, right? I mean, just think of placing a metric ball here. As you see, I mean, the metric ball is some non-trivial topology. To get rid of it, to be able to contract it, I have to enlarge the radius in such a way that I can slide it all the way over this cusp here. And well, if somehow these cusps get worse and worse, I mean, then this ratio gets worse and worse, and I cannot do it with a fixed uh, constant L. Yeah. So this is a condition, I mean, which is particularly relevant in this context because it's a condition that is quasi-symmetrically invariant in the sense that, well, if, uh, if I have a space where this is true here with a certain constant L, they look at a quasi-symmetric image of the space or a space that is quasi-symmetrically uh, equivalent, well, then the same condition will be true, well, maybe with a different constant. Yeah. And well, the intuitive reason is roughly this. So quasi-symmetry is a condition where relative distances are relevant. And here in this condition, it doesn't really matter what the r is. The only thing that matters is the ratio of this r and this radius. So here we really have a condition where also relative distance is uh, relevant. And so this indicates, well, this should probably be quasi-symmetrically invariant, and it's actually not a hard exercise to, to show this uh, precisely. Okay? So this is one uh, condition that I need. The other condition that I need uh, is Arthur's regularity that already came up. So here's a quick reminder. So a metric space is called Arthur's regular. If the Hausdorff Q measure, Hausdorff measure with exponent Q, is very well behaved in the sense that if I look at the Hausdorff Q measure of a ball, well, it should not be too large, it should be bounded by the diameter of uh, my space, then it's comparable to uh, the Qth power of R up to some fixed multiplicative constants independent of, uh, of the ball. Yeah. So in some sense, I mean, you can think of this Arthur's regularity condition as uh, as a way of saying that the space is housed of dimension Q in a very strong sense. Yeah, so if you know that uh, space is housed of dimension Q, I mean, this does not give you any information in general about housed of Q, how housed of Q measures behave. And here we are making a very strong requirement on the behavior of housed of Q measure. So, I mean, in some sense, I mean, this, this can be thought of as a strong requirement uh, that the space is housed of dimension Q. All right, uh, so here's a theorem that gives some information on these uh, quasi-symmetric uniformization or parametrization uh, problems for two spheres. So it's a theorem that is uh, due to uh, Bruce Klein and myself. Well, as you see, I mean, it's already, well, almost uh, 10 years old. Uh, so if you have a metric two spheres, so in other words, a, a sphere uh, equipped with, with some uh, metric, uh, then you want to know whether it's quasi-symmetrically equivalent to the standard two-sphere. And the theorem gives a uh, sufficient condition. So it says that if you have this linear local contractibility and you add in this uh, Arthur's regularity with exponent two, well, then you get the implication that you want. This condition is a nice condition because it's necessary. And it's also quasi-symmetrically equivalent. This Arthur's regularity is a condition that is very natural in this context. So for example, if you have a boundary of a Gromov hyperbolic group, then you will always be Arthur's regular with some exponent. 
But unfortunately, in these settings where this comes up, uh, the exponent will certainly be larger than 2. Yeah, so what we're saying here, if you're in the extreme case, we have the smallest possible exponent. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, we have a two-sphere, so for topological reasons, the, the exponent here cannot be less than 2. So if we have the smallest possible exponent, well, then we get a nice conclusion. So we proved uh, other theorems. Actually, we proved theorems that give necessary and sufficient conditions. I don't want to state them because they're a bit too technical. I'm stating this because, in some sense, I mean, this is an advertisement uh, for, for a talk on, on Thursday. Namely, uh, well, we always thought that this is a nice theorem, but, well, it probably doesn't have much applications. But it actually turned out that it was recently applied by my uh, former student, uh, Qian Yin, in a, a PhD thesis. And what she did is she applied this theorem essentially to give a, a combinatorial characterization of, certain, uh, of, of a certain class of, of Thurston, uh, expanding Thurston maps, the so-called Latte maps. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say here is that, uh, well, if you, if you prove these kind of uh, uniformization theorems, in particular for uh, two spheres, I mean, then you get some uh, immediate uh, benefits. Okay. Let, me, uh, let me talk about some further directions. So, uh, well, I mean, one of the main points that I was trying uh, to make in my talk is that if you look at these uh, uh, expanding thirst maps, then they're always uh, related uh, to these uh, combinatorial subdivision rules. One interesting question, I mean, it's a bit loosely defined here, is uh, what is special actually about the rational thirst maps? Right? So how can you recognize from these pictures whether uh, you actually have a map on your hands that is conjugate to a rational map or not? Uh, another uh, very interesting question, I can't really go into this, is uh, Thurston has a, actually a necessary and sufficient condition when, uh, well, an expanding Thurston map is, in a certain sense, equivalent to a rational map. So it is based on some behavior on, uh, on, of the dynamics on, uh, of the map on uh, isotopic classes of curves. So it would be very interesting to reconcile his approach, which is essentially, well, uh, he, he reformulates this into some kind of fixed point problem on the Teichmüller space. So it would be very interesting to reconcile uh, his approach with this kind of combinatorial approach based on subdivision rules, right? So what I'm asking here is, can one actually reprove uh, Thurston's theorem uh, in, in the spirit of uh, combinatorics of, of uh, Thurston maps? One thing is a bit annoying in this theory is, yeah, uh, I always have to pass to this iterate. And well, for people in dynamics, maybe this is not a big deal, but it would be kind of nice, actually, to have an invariant object for the map itself. So there are examples, actually, that show that uh, a general expanding thirst map will not have an invariant Jordan curve. But maybe you can generalize this a little bit. So for example, I mean, how about if you allow an invariant graph, which would essentially be as good as an invariant Jordan curve, because you're just interested in the cell decompositions and uh, these subdivision rules. So you might ask this question. So is there always an invariant? Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. Right. A finite, finite graph. Yeah. And then uh, an another, another uh, very interesting reaction, I think, is, is, as I already mentioned, I mean, you could relax this condition of expanding, which corresponds in the rational case just to requiring that the Julia set is the whole Riemann sphere, you could relax this a little bit to actually allow more general Julia sets. Yeah, and this would be a theory that very much corresponds to the theory of subhyperbolic rational maps, or well, at least uh, postcritically finite uh, subhyperbolic rational maps. So one very interesting case, for example, is the case where uh, these Julia sets are actually a Shapinsky carpet, some self-similar fractals. Yeah. So I think that's a place to stop here. Thanks. Comments, questions? I have one question to you. So, okay. uh, you said that you have uh, jobs to a region of the physical cell. So, you obtain invariant jobs and you obtain some metapathological circles. It is some kind of invariant for your expanding DMF. <laughs> so, uh, the question is whether it is possible to classify it. The dynamics on this invariant. On the dynamics on the invariant uh, curve. That's a very interesting question, yeah. That's a very interesting question. 
But it's not canonical. Right now, this is a very interesting, but I think a very difficult question also. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you, if you look at these invariant Jordan curves, I mean, of course, you can restrict the dynamical system just to the Jordan curve. So you get an essentially dynamical system on the circle. And the question is, you know, whether you can somehow classify uh, these dynamical systems or whether you can describe it, whether you can see from uh, this dynamics on the Jordan curve, whether you have a rational map in your hands and, you know, the general relation between the dynamics of the map and the dynamics on this Jordan curve. So you have this uh, quasi circle that's forward invariant. So when you pull it back by the dynamics, you get a partition of the. Yeah, these are exactly the cell decompositions that I was talking about. And, right, and but these uh, domains has the the Jordan curves that uh, are the uh, frontiers of these cells are uniformly quasi circles. Yes, so they're so uniform quasi circles. We'll have to be a bit careful here. So they're uniform quasi circles in the rational case if you just take a sphere, uh, the spherical metric. Yes. If you look at this general uh, Thurston map case, then you have to look at uh, this canonical snowflake gauge. And there it makes sense to talk about quasi-circles and things like this, and they are uniform quasi-circles. For every partition, for every yeah, yeah. doesn't matter how you many. You get exactly the same constant. So they are uniform not only, f well, I mean, of course, on each level you have only finitely many, then they're automatically uniform, but they're uniform over all levels. Not uh, equivalent to a rational map. Yes. Can you read off the Thurston abstraction from your subdivision? Well, that's of course. I mean, essentially, my second question here, right? Whether, yeah, that's a very interesting question, and I think one. Well, I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say is it's such a difficult question to get a better understanding of the relevant issues. Maybe it's a good start actually to reconcile it with our Thurston approach. Personally, I think you should be able to do this. But there's probably no easy answer. One more question. Yes. So if you try to apply the Bruce's theorem from, the, from his talk about Q regular space, implementation of the Q regular mm -hmm. spaces, if you try to apply to your situation, what is the main difficulty? So well, I mean, you have to prove that something is Löwner. And actually, I mean, in this situation, <laughs> uh, my two sphere equipped with uh, one of these metrics in the canonical uh, snowflake gauge is Lerner if and only if I'm conjugate to a rational map. So somehow I have to independently recognize the Lerner property, and that's usually not easy. And it's uh, not easy because I always have this ambiguity of the snowflaking in my uh, gauge, right? And uh, if I'm not at the right exponent and I just snowflake a little bit, then I destroy the Lerner property. Yeah, so it's in general, in general, my canonical snowflake gauge will actually not contain any Lerner metric. It will contain maybe a Lerner metric up to quasi-symmetry, but that's a kind of difficult question. Yeah. So it's, it's not clear whether this helps or not. I mean, this, uh, this other theorem that I, that I put up, I mean, if you're interested, I mean, you should go to the talk. Uh, yeah. So here, in, in, in this setting, you can really explicitly apply this theorem. And what you do is essentially you uh, well look at the snowflake gauge of metrics, and you really are able to somehow minimize the exponent and show that the metric then that you get is uh, R force 2 regular. This condition is easy. It's always true for, for, my, uh, for my spheres equipped with these canonical gauges. So the relevant condition here for this theorem is, is this R force 2 regularity. But this is very difficult. Any other questions, comments? Okay, let's speak it again.